Jo. Okay. Okay. Welcome back to the Art Tech Seminar. <coughs> so the next presenter here is a tracker musician who decided to create a music tracker for himself and it turned into a lengthy project. So please welcome Tomi Jylhä Ollila. Okay, so uh, hi everyone. My name is Tomi Jylhä Ollila. And uh, I would like to share some thoughts uh, on musical performance and tracker music and how my thoughts inspired me to uh, write a new tracker program for myself. So I would like to start with a quick question. How many of you here have uh, never seen a tracker program play a piece of tracked music? Okay, I see a couple of hands raised, so we'll remedy that right now, and uh, I guess most of you ha uh, haven't seen my tracker, <laughs> so here goes. Do we have sound? Hi-hat. Does anyone hear a hi-hat? Okay. Okay. Can you hear the hi hat? Okay. So. Oh, okay. I'll start. I'll start over from the beginning. So, now. Okay, <laughs> so um, let me tell you a little bit about my background. So I have made uh, music with a bunch of tracker programs. I started in around 1988 or 89 with one of the earliest sound tracker clones for the Amiga. And then I spent some time with no Noise Tracker and a lot of time with Pro Tracker 1.1. And uh, around 1995, I finally moved on to PC with uh, one of the earliest uh, releases of Impulse Tracker 1. Uh, then I spent some time with Fast Tracker 2. And when I discovered Impulse Tracker 2, I was completely hooked. And I spent a lot of time developing uh, techniques to get as much uh, out of the system as I could. Uh, now, all of these trackers are, are considered old school by today's standards. Uh, the main advancements on these PC trackers over here were increased polyphony, and in the case of uh, Impulse Tracker, uh, easier management of polyphony, uh, as well as uh, instrument abstractions that uh, provided uh, some more convenient interfaces to uh, deal with the, uh, the samples. But uh, all, all of these uh, uh, trackers' uh, primary way of making sound was to uh, manipulate the pitch and volume of monophonic sound samples. And uh, around 2001, I finally came to the conclusion that uh, I couldn't uh, really translate all the ideas in my head to old school tracker notation. So I decided to start uh, eventually in, in 2007 work on Conquat, my own tracker project. So some of the goals that I had in mind uh, were mostly uh, related to musical performance. So when I write music with uh, uh, a tracker program, 
uh, I want to be able to uh, focus 100% on musical expression. I want to avoid having to hack my way around uh, <coughs> with, uh, around the limitations of the uh, notation system in order to achieve uh, uh, the sound that, uh, that I'm after. And uh, I've also been very interested in uh, alternative tunings and uh, 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 scales. Uh, so that's something that I wanted to support from the very beginning. And you may have noticed that uh, in my first example that there were some intervals that uh, are not uh, uh, typical in uh, Western music tradition. Um, there was a clear Arabic influence there. So, uh, let me tell you about some of the uh, <clears throat> some of the main characteristics of tracker notation. Uh, so, trackers are music sequences, and, uh, and their primary output is usually uh, the uh, uh, the final audio representation of music. Uh, the, uh, the stuff that's uh, meant for listeners to enjoy. Now, this is in contrast to, uh, say, score writing software such as uh, MuseScore or Sibelius, whose primary output is sheet music notation, and their sound producing capabilities are mostly intended for testing purposes. So, over here you can see an example of uh, uh, a musical phrase expressed in tracker notation uh, in the old school way. I've used Milky Tracker to make this example. Uh, so one of the key characteristics of tracker notation is that it's laid out along a vertical time axis and most of the notation is in text format. And uh, as the uh, as the time axis is vertical, everything that's simultaneous is specified uh, on a single horizontal row. And uh, uh, each of these horizontal rows correspond to a step made by the step sequencer uh, during playback. And uh, uh, each uh, row is typically uh, a 16th note uh, in duration by default. And the length of a note is uh, determined by its vertical distance to the next note or rest. So here you can see the notes. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you can uh, see a lot of the uh, stuff that I think uh, makes up the magic of trackers. This is where the interesting stuff is happening. Uh, here are some very specific ways to control uh, features like uh, volume and uh, vibrato, pitch slides, and other kinds of effects that you can uh, use to make your music sound more, uh, more expressive. So, uh, sheet music notation is very different in both appearance and purpose. Over here you can see the same musical phrase uh, in uh, sheet music notation, and uh, there's not a whole lot of text. Uh, the notes are these symbols, and uh, the length of a note is uh, determined by its shape, and the time goes from left to right. Uh, and uh, any uh, instructions of uh, musical expression are uh, either vaguer uh, or, in this example, left out completely. <clears throat> so, uh, I like the way that time is represented in trackers, because if you can take a look at these two notes over here, uh, you can cl clearly see that these two notes are the same length. They are both three rows long. Uh, the same part in tr uh, the sheet music notation is right here. And to an untrained eye, it's not as clear that uh, those two notes are the same length, or even the fact that uh, this part is played with uh, two notes uh, in the first place. It kind of looks like uh, there might be three notes. Now, there are some ways in which uh, a representation like this is useful for uh, um, people who play music from uh, sheet music notation, but uh, I won't go into that. So, a person who's using, uh, say, score writing software would typically be uh, a composer or an arranger who will ultimately rely on human players to perform their music and to, uh, turn it into an auditory experience. Uh, tracker musicians, on the other hand, rely on the software, uh, the tracker program itself, to uh, produce the final sound. So, they will often uh, assume the additional role of a performer, an instrument modeler, 
and even more. Uh, during this presentation, I will mostly focus on how Conquat supports the role of a performer. Now, the reason why I think uh, the way we represent time is very important uh, in, a, in a software like a tracker is that uh, uh, when you think about uh, musical performance uh, of live musicians, uh, they, they don't always follow a strict steady pulse, uh, even in genres that uh, are very... Uh, uh, very rhythm oriented there's always uh, some aspects to their uh, their playing where they deviate from uh, a perfectly steady machine like pulse uh, in some way so uh, so how we can uh, represent uh, these uh, deviations uh, is very important so here's another example uh, with a comparison between sheet music and tracker notation so it's uh, a simple musical idea, and uh, it's a stacked uh, co oh, it's a chord of stacked uh, fourth intervals, and this is what it might sound like. Okay, so over here on the sheet music side, you can see the notes uh, that represent uh, the uh, different pitches and the duration of the chord. Uh, the MP stands for mezzo piano, which uh, indicates that the chord is to be played fairly soft. And this squiggle over here means that uh, the chord is arpeggiated, meaning that uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's supposed to be played in a way uh, where each note follows one another uh, in a very quick succession, like this rather than play simultaneously, which uh, would sound like this. Now, one key thing to note, uh, notice about uh, or know about the uh, sheet music notation is that uh, uh, it's targeted at uh, human performers will, who will ultimately decide how, uh, how to play this. Uh, and uh, they use their judgment based on context to their uh, experience, personal preferences, and so on. The tracker notation, on the other hand, has a very specific definition, and together with uh, instrument uh, definitions and some global parameters, this specifies pretty much exactly the desired audio output. So over here you can see the different uh, notes, uh, in tracker notation highlighted. And next to the notes, we have specified the instrument uh, with a number. Next to the instrument numbers, we have uh, volume levels specified individually for, uh, for each note. So this is very precise, something that, that's uh, suitable for computers. And then these weird things. Um, now, I mentioned uh, previously that uh, everything that's simultaneous is on a single horizontal row, and each of these rows uh, can take up a certain amount of time, typically a 16th note by default. Now, a 16th note is around one or two tenths of a second in absolute time, and that's far too coarse grained uh, for a subtle timing effect like this. Uh, if I had used uh, separate rows uh, um, for, the, for these different uh, notes in order to m make them start at different times, it would have been more like da 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 da. So uh, it wouldn't have had the same effect. So, what uh, most trackers have supported uh, for a long time are these delay commands. That's what the ED stands for, that allow uh, you to start the playback of a note uh, within the execution of this first row here, but uh, slightly later than the beginning of the row. So uh, over here, you can see that the F uh, starts uh, sl slightly after C, and uh, the A sharp over here starts a little bit later than F uh, or, or C, and so on. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, uh, the approach works quite all right for this uh, particular example, but uh, this only 
increases, uh, at least in old school trackers, uh, the effective time resolution to about 50 steps per second, which is not sufficient for all kinds of uh, playing techniques associated with real instruments. But perhaps more importantly, I find uh, the usage of these delay commands really inconvenient, and it's, it feels really disconnected from the otherwise very na uh, natural way we represent time in trackers. And uh, I, uh, I used to often wish that I could just uh, insert my notes and all the effects somewhere in between these rows that have been laid out in front of me. Uh, so I decided to allow myself to do just that. So here's the same example in Conquat notation. Uh, over here you can see the uh, note, and uh, next to the note the volume commands are the same for each column here. And, uh, and there, there's no delay commands required here. Uh, if you look at these uh, horizontal lines above these commands, uh, they indicate the exact position of these events on the time axis. So, so there's a clear visual indication that uh, these notes are not simultaneous, uh, but uh, they follow each other in quick succession. And. Uh, now I'd like to show you an example where I have found this way of representing time really useful. So here we go. So, um, guitar has, uh, oh, has been one of those instruments that's really hard to uh, get to sound right in uh, trackers, and I don't think I've managed to uh, uh, nail down all the details uh, of the sound, but uh, let me show you something interesting over here. So here's a uh, zoomed-in representation of the very first guitar strums at the beginning. And uh, this is what it sounded like. So, blink and you miss it. I'll play it one more time. So, what I tried to do uh, here was, uh, uh, was to think about what an actual guitar player would do when they, uh, when they play their instruments with quick strums like this. Uh, so, uh, they would probably uh, first strum uh, downwards, which means that uh, they will hit the uh, lowest, uh, the, the string with the lowest pitch first. So uh, that's why I've uh, played the lowest note of this chord first, and then I, uh, I uh, play uh, uh, the rest of the uh, strings slightly afterwards. And uh, I, I also took into account the possibility that they might actually hit uh, one string with more than one finger, so that's w why you see uh, some notes replicated, but uh, I don't do this all the time, but uh, sometimes it makes a difference uh, in the final sound. And, uh, and then the next strum uh, is going to be upwards, so that's why the, uh, the order of the notes is reversed. Now, um, yeah, and uh, another thing that uh, you can see from the notation here is that uh, the layout is really free form, and I can insert an arbitrary amount of uh, different events uh, in the notation, and uh, I never run out of space, uh, which uh, I find really important. And because, uh, you know, say, say, if you look at this example over here, you can see that uh, uh, on the first row of the uh, second column, for instance, this, uh, this has already been filled with commands and you can't fit any, uh, any more specifiers if, even if you wanted to. So, um, so that's, uh, that was the kind of flexibility that I wanted to have. Okay, so I'll uh, switch to another topic. I would like to talk about another major thing that uh, uh, motivated me to write my own tracker. So, uh, over here you can see a screenshot of uh, my, one of my old uh, impulse tracker modules, or rather impulse tracker showing a, a couple of uh, 
notes from uh, my impulse tracker module, and uh, uh, and uh, you can see that there are two melody lines spread out to eight channels, and. Uh, you may be wondering why I would need eight channels for two melody lines. Uh, but uh, I guess uh, those of you with uh, a bit more experience with tracker programs know exactly what's going on. So this is how we used to simulate echo back in the good old days, or not so good, depending on your viewpoint. Uh, uh, so. Uh, Impulse Tracker, like most of the trackers of, uh, of that era, did not have uh, advanced signal processing capabilities, so there was, uh, there was no echo effect uh, available directly. So what I and mo uh, many other tracker musicians did at the time was that uh, we played the same notes more than once, once for every direction that we wanted the sound to come from. And, uh, I would additionally make, uh, <clears throat> make a, a, uh, certain reverb copies uh, of my uh, instruments that uh, sounded a bit softer, uh, and uh, they had so some of the uh, um, pitch and timing uh, details slightly adjusted so that when I played all of these notes from different directions simultaneously, it gave, me a, uh, gave, it gave the illusion of wide space. Now, this worked okay most of the time, but the maintenance cost on the notation side was huge. Uh, you see, if, if I wanted to make a change to any of my melody lines, I would have to make sure that all these echo copies of my notes were updated accordingly. So, uh, so it distracted me from uh, focusing on musical expression, which I found so important. And uh, additionally, uh, having these echo channels uh, caused the no uh, score itself to uh, spread out so wide that it was, it was kind of difficult to see what I was working on because I could all, uh, only see like uh, uh, three or four uh, different melody lines simultaneously in the tracker. So that was uh, a real pain in the neck uh, <coughs> at times. Uh, now. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to explain too much about this because uh, this is a problem that has been solved by modern trackers in a number of different ways. Uh, but uh, uh, my approach uh, has been, well, uh, similar to many um, mod uh, modern synthesizer environments. So it's based on this uh, uh, metaphor of uh, connecting like physical instruments with audio cables to affect units. And, uh, and so on. But this is something that uh, has developed quite, uh, quite a bit during the years that I've worked on Conquat, uh, and to the point that uh, uh, I no longer only uh, use this kind of a graph rep representation to specify uh, acoustic details like reverb or other room effects, but uh, I actually specify these uh, different instruments uh, with similar graphs, which uh, are often more complex, but uh, they're using more elementary components to make up the sound. Uh, it's not quite as uh, powerful as, say, 64 clang, but uh, it's still quite fle flexible. It, so it's a, a kind of a polyphonic modular synthesizer, and uh, and I can uh, I can use the system to uh, model the majority of my own instruments. Uh, <clears throat> so the um, the drum sounds that you've heard. Uh, they are all sample-based, but uh, all the other sounds uh, that I play during this presentation, they are made exclusively in, uh, with this uh, internal synthesizer of Conquat. So, as I said, uh, uh, I mostly use quite uh, simple components to make up the, uh, make up the instruments, but uh, there are certain more complicated instruments that tend to steal the show, and uh, these include uh, algorithms like car plus strong string synthesis, uh, the pad synth algorithm, and freeverb. Uh, now, all of these are like uh, more than a decade old by now, so there's nothing like state of the art here. But, uh, but it's not just about uh, what algorithms uh, you have, but how you use them. For instance, you may have noticed that uh, 
my guitar sounds ha uh, have these uh, handling noises uh, associated with note of events and uh, uh, and also uh, like fret fret noises uh, associated with s sudden changes in pitch. Uh, so those are some of the things that. Uh, um, make the instrument um, instrument sound more natural. So, um, so why am I so uh, interested in uh, musical performance uh, that I would uh, decide uh, design uh, tracker features around uh, this uh, <coughs> this point of view? Uh, well. To me, uh, music is a way of communicating. I want to say something with my music. And it's, it's not that I have necessarily like a story that I could ever put into words, but it's some kind of an emotion that I want, uh, want to communicate with my music. Think about some of the uh, best known scene musicians out there, like Jogair Lilidol, or Format, or perhaps Martin Wall. Uh, we keep listening to these musicians not only because of their skills as composers, but be because the way they express themselves musically brings their stories closer to us. And you can definitely tell that these people are storytellers. Many, uh, many chiptune artists are masters of musical expression, and they have to be because uh, their instruments themselves are not very expressive. The emotion has to come from the musician. So, I wrote a short example that hopefully illustrates, <coughs> illustrates the importance of musical expression. Uh, I hope the background noise uh, doesn't disturb too much, but um, um, so if, uh, uh, if my audio samples uh, seem kind of weird and uh, uh, you have no idea what I'm talking about, you can check the uh, recording of this presentation later. <laughs> hopefully it uh, will It'll be a bit clearer then. Um, before I uh, play my examples, I would like to point out that uh, this is no, uh, no way, in no way a definitive or, or correct way of doing things. You might agree with some of my stylistic choices, uh, and that's okay. But uh, I'm going to f um, play, play a short musical, uh, musical section that... Uh, 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 with two different approaches. Uh, the first one is a very simple uh, version uh, that only contains the right notes. And uh, the, the other version is going to be uh, a version with musical expression where I actually take uh, an approach of a musician uh, to the material. So, first the simple version. And then the expressive version, oops, sorry, this one. Now, uh, one of the first things that I noticed about the simple version is that it really sounded like a computer playing. The, the tempo was... Uh, strictly metronomic, which made it sound very mechanical. And uh, to me, at least, the uh, instruments didn't seem to cooperate that well. Uh, but once we added dynamics, uh, that is, changed how loud or soft we played, we could uh, give the music a more organic feel. And uh, I also uh, added space to the music by adjusting uh, the tempo slightly uh, to give uh, some form to, uh, to the music uh, so it wouldn't sound uh, as static. And then uh, I added a bunch of uh, decorations throughout the flute section. Uh, one of the things you probably noticed was that I added vibrato, which is this oscillation of pitch. And, uh, and uh, the key thing to uh, 
notice about that is that it's uh, I didn't just uh, plug the vibrato in and call it a day. I used it uh, in uh, well, I used it less uh, in certain parts and uh, made it more pronounced in other parts. Uh, uh, so, so it's uh, that way you can make it an expressive device instead of uh, the vibrato being just texture. And then I also uh, uh, added other, other kinds of details, which I will explain one by one. So here are the first three notes. So. Uh, uh, one of the things that I did was that uh, I approached the second note from a neighboring tone below with a really quick pitch slide. And, and then I uh, approached the third note with a couple of short decorative notes in front. Right there. And uh, the next uh, part is very similar in... Uh, uh, in content. Basically a variation of the first. And I used many of the same techniques, uh, but not all of them, because uh, there's always a danger that uh, I end up overusing uh, these elements, and that will make the music sound awkward instead of expressive. So the next part Over here, I entered the last note with a quick pitch slide from above. That might have been uh, difficult to hear, but uh, if I wanted to, I could have tried something a bit more pronounced, like this. But uh, I felt that uh, wasn't really natural, uh, at least for this instrument. It might have wor worked better with, say, a tin whistle or something. Um, and uh, on the last part, when you listen to my interpretation of this, uh, you can hear qu uh, quite clearly what I thought was the most significant note over here. So it was the note on the first downbeat that has had the sharpest attack and uh, uh, strongest vibrato. And uh, the approach to uh, the, the final note was accompanied by uh, the most pronounced use of uh, these decorative tones that I mentioned previously. And then the guitar section. Over here, I adjusted some of the plucking parameters uh, to make certain notes stand out brighter than others. And, uh, I also adjusted the timing of uh, individual notes so that, for instance, the chords would sound like guitar strums, uh, just like I did with my previous example. And over here, you can also hear quite clearly the, uh, uh, the slight tempo fluctuations, fluctuations that I added. So now that I've explained all these details, uh, uh, let me play you the uh, full examples uh, one more time now that you all know what to focus on. So first, the simple version. You can tell how I feel about the simple version by looking at my head. And uh, then the expressive version. And with the instrumentation, I uh, kept uh, adjusting the volume levels, uh, which was one of the components that uh, gives the uh, music uh, a clearer structure, and it feels like it's uh, actually going somewhere. Uh, now, why do I spend so much time talking about all of this? Uh, 
my goal here is to uh, shed some light on the nature of musical expression. Because uh, when, we, uh, when we think about uh, skilled musicians and the way they put emotion into their music, the way they do it may often seem quite elusive and mysterious and something that's like a pure result of their inspiration or whatever. But, uh, well, I do th uh, agree that there is a sense of mystery in there, at least for me. Uh, but if we take a close look at what they're actually doing, we can find these very con concrete and physical elements uh, in, uh, in, in all the ways they express themselves musically. Uh, and there's a certain language of style uh, embedded in our uh, culture of music that we have all internalized to some level. Uh, for instance, uh, there was a reason why I chose to decorate certain parts of my examples and not others, and it's because of this language. And uh, the best tracker and SID musicians out there, they know this stuff because they have, they have had to uh, explain their software how to be expressive. But not too many people talk about this, and I find that quite unfortunate. Uh, because I feel that as our software and equipment has grown more and more powerful, we've begun to rely more and more on our tools to make the music for us. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I think that's, uh, that's a shame. And, uh, uh, the, uh, the music has to come from us as musicians. These are just tools. So, I'm almost done with my uh, presentation, but I would like to uh, say that uh, oh, I haven't been on this journey alone. My friend Tony Rotto uh, has given me a tremendous amount of sp support during the years, and he has helped me lay out the foundations of the tracker. And uh, also another friend of mine, Osi Sareshoya, who is uh, in the audience, uh, uh, has implemented most of the digital filters of Conquart. So Conquart wouldn't really sound the same without him. So uh, I highly appreciate that. Um, there might actually be some time for questions. But uh, if there is no t uh, time for your question specifically, then feel free to just come over to me and talk to me after this. Uh, I'll hang around for some time. So, thank you. If you do have any questions, I can bring you the microphone and we have a couple minutes. Okay. Um, what is your opinion on adding like uh, procedurally generated elements, for example, or random variations or other such things into the composition? Uh, that's a good question. Randomness, I find, uh, is a, uh, a very tricky thing. Uh, I've actually used uh, a lot of randomness uh, uh, with my instruments, for instance, the guitar sound. Uh, each, of the, uh, each of the plucks uh, uh, sounds slightly different. But the challenge with randomness uh, like that uh, is uh, that you need to make it very uniform uh, in quality because you, you don't want, uh, ever want to uh, be in a situation where uh, you feel bad about the way your music sounds because you, uh, because you got uh, like bad RNG, as <laughs> speedrunners might say. <laughs> so does that answer your question? Also, um, for example, um, there could be also like um, more deterministic generation. For example, uh, you could say just play this kind of chord or make this kind of pattern. All oh, right, so randomization of compositional elements. Mm, yes, perhaps, or perhaps kind of like a shortcut or randomization or something in between that. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm, I haven't really put that much thought into it. Uh, there are certain. Uh, uh, features for interactivity support in Conquad, but uh, uh, it's, uh, there, there's not much uh, procedural generation going on there, so it, it's all very much predetermined. Uh, could you say something about the alternative tuning systems? Well, sure. Uh, I can actually show uh, uh, show some stuff. Uh, 
So this was the uh, the piece that had uh, the uh, the weird scale. Let's see. Um, let's use the guitar sound, for instance. So here's the uh, here's the characteristic neutral second interval. That's kind of uh, weird. You can cl uh, hear it perhaps clearer if I play a scale. Oops. So, uh, so the um, uh, the system is actually quite simple. Uh, I uh, I only uh, have these uh, note names for display purposes, and uh, the no the pitches are uh, internally stored as, uh, simply as uh, floating point numbers, which uh, uh, describe the. Uh, uh, pitch distance from the uh, middle A, which is 440 hertz. And, uh, okay, it's a little bit difficult for me because I have to watch this uh, display screen over here, but uh, um, uh, this is a horrible interface. But, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, over here I've uh, defined the custom, uh, <clears throat> custom notation where I've specified uh, the um, the pitches as uh, fractions, which are like uh, intervals from the uh, uh, the bass tone uh, of the uh, of the key. So uh, my key is centered around D, and uh, 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 and uh, these uh, fractions describe uh, the different intervals uh, in the scale. Uh, not sure how much time uh, I have to uh, have for explaining this, but uh, uh, does this kind of answer your question, or was there something specific you would like to know? Okay. <laughs> sure. Anything else? Oops. At what level of maturity is the Kuana Quad? I mean, if I, I'm a musician and I want to use it, then uh, would you recommend to use it like right now or <laughs> wait for a while? Um, well, the thing is that, uh, well, it's still very much uh, under development, uh, and I'm sure that the, uh, I will refine many of the details uh, still. and. Uh, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's kind of reached a point where while I probably uh, haven't fully locked down all the file format details, at this point, if, uh, if there's a lot of interest from people, I can probably re release a, like a conf converter script in case I happen to change the file format in some way uh, so that people can uh, convert their, um, the music that they make make with this version uh, into a new form, uh, new version of the format. But, uh, but I, I would have to say that uh, uh, I'm perhaps not very organized in the sense of, uh, you know, what kind of a plan or, uh, or timeline that, uh, I would have for the project. I just, uh, uh, I, I just uh, take whatever time I have for uh, moving things forward and see where it takes me. Um, one thing that I should probably say that uh, currently this uh, only runs on a GNU plus Linux system, but uh, if uh, anyone wants to help with porting efforts, I'll highly appreciate it. Uh, yeah, hopefully it will be uh, uh, something that you can run in uh, all the major operating systems at some point. Uh, I started to wonder that if you think about the musical performance of a live artist, all, all the stylistic elements that he or she uses, I wonder, I'm not a musician, I wonder if there does even exist a notation for all the finesse that might be there, because of course, typically in your notes, it's not there. Uh, I wonder if there is any formalism uh, that somebody has tried to catch the 
actual like beat level details of all the stylistic elements elements on the performance and now you kind of have a chance to build that so this could be an instrument in researching a live performance style and maybe this project could work together with some people who are trying to uh, do, do, do all of some formalisms for that. Right, so um, I haven't actually done that much uh, research. Uh, I'm not an eth ethnomusicologist or anything, but, uh, but I would imagine that uh, uh, there are many aspects of, uh, uh, of uh, musical performance that uh, simply don't have uh, uh, a notation or at least uh, uh, any, any kind of standard notation. And, uh, and in Conquat, uh, I actually uh, have support uh, for uh, for custom uh, custom event specifications, uh, so that uh, well, uh, by default it only supports like uh, volume and pitch adjustment. But uh, you can configure your instruments in a way that uh, you can uh, adjust uh, or control uh, uh, elements like. Uh, 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 like uh, how, for instance, with a guitar, how much nail you use for picking them, or, and uh, details like that. So, uh, so if you uh, if you want to go go the extra mile of uh, uh, specifying uh, all kinds of uh, interesting details with your instrument, you can do that. For instance, here's my guitar. <laughs> um, uh, it's it's a bit of a mess. Uh, I'm sorry about that, but uh, it actually contains uh, s uh, different. Uh, so, uh, some of the components are shared by all strings, but some uh, but others are uh, uh, used only by certain strings of the guitar. So yeah, does uh, does that answer your question? Cool. We're running late on time here, but um, as Tommy said, he's going to stay and be able to chat with you if you have any further questions. Thank you very much, Tommy. Thank you.